Part two, the obstacle. What is keeping me from bearing fruit in my life? Right? What is keeping me from living my vocation statement? Before we jump into um, a deep analysis of the obstacle in our life, I think it's, it's very helpful just to give a simple response to that question before starting. Right? One time I was talking to a lady in spiritual direction and I asked her, okay, what is keeping you from living your vocation statement? And she immediately said, I feel like a poser. I said, that's great. You know, you're probably not going to find uh, that word in the theological dictionary about all the dominant defects and your sins and things like that. But that made sense to her. It was from her heart. You know, she felt like a poser. She felt like she wasn't really authentic in her relationship with God. And as we began to dig deeper, we could see some of the life experiences that led to that. Um, difficult relationships that led her to closing down inside that did not allow her to enter into intimate relationships with others nor with God. And so for that reason, she felt that lack of an authentic relationship with God. So she was living her faith on the outside, but not on the inside. So it's a very simple one word response to the question, but that can be very helpful because it gives us uh, a simple image of where we're going to be going so that we don't get lost in this analysis of ourselves and trying to see how all the different you know, potential manifestations of sin uh, apply to us and, and keep us from living our vocation. So maybe take some a moment just to ask yourself that before we continue. Now we have the tree of life. And ideally, we have rich soil, which allows the tree to sink deep roots, which in turn provide for a healthy trunk and which ultimately produces abundant fruits, right? But for our current purposes, we're going to look at the tree of my life. And amidst all those good fruits, we're also going to see that there are some bad fruits, which are my actual sins. But we want to go deep and see exactly where those sins are coming from down in the trunk, which is my dominant defect. And finally, what is nurturing that, which are the roots and my insecurities. First, the fruits. We can see all those bad fruits in our life, which are our actual sins. And as we're trying to make progress in the spiritual life, we want to try to avoid those. We start plucking them off and, you know, avoiding sin and vice and bad habits and bad places, right? But we can get a little bit frustrated in the spiritual life because they keep coming back. And so it can seem like we're not making much progress. But at the same time, we can get a little frustrated because it can seem a little bit confusing and like there could be a lot of dispersion in our spiritual life because we see all these different sins popping up, right? We see criticism and then self-indulgence, anger, insincerity, laziness, independence, comfort seeking, lust, hypocrisy, attention seeking, jealousy, control, and the list goes on, right? So we can see all these different sins in our life and we can wonder where do we begin and we start working on one and then we start working on another and then a crisis happens in our life and we switch to another and in the end we can feel like we're just you know shadow boxing as saint paul would say and we're not making any progress in the spiritual life so what do we have to do well we have to begin to examine a little bit further and see what these different sins have in common which will bring us down to the trunk of the tree, which is the next part. Second, the trunk. While we're looking at all these different fruits, we can wonder what does criticism, independence, control, and anger have to do with each other? Well, they all come from the same trunk of putting your security in yourself, which is pride. Or what does insincerity, hypocrisy, attention seeking, jealousy have to do with each other? Well, they all come from the same trunk, which is putting your security in what others think of you, which is vanity. And lastly, what do comfort seeking, self-indulgence, lust, and laziness have to do with each other? Well, they all come from the same trunk, which is putting your security 
in possessions and pleasures of this world, which is sensuality. So we go back to the question. What is keeping you from bearing fruit? What is keeping me from living my vocation statement? Is it pride? Putting my security in myself? Vanity? Putting security in what others think of me? Or sensuality? Putting security in possessions and pleasures of this world? It can be very difficult, right, to to know, and that's why it's so important to have answered that question simply at the beginning. What is keeping me from living my vocation statement? And oftentimes that one word answer will give us a deeper insight uh, to this. But what are some ways that we can discover our dominant defect? Well, first, you can list the top 10 sins in your life and try to go in and analyze what was I really seeking when I did those sins? What was I really looking for? Right? Or if you feel like maybe the top 10 sins of your life aren't very representative of your whole life because maybe it was just at a certain age of time of rebellion or something like that, you could list the sins that have affected your key relationships over the past two years, right? And discover what it was that you were seeking there and why those hurt your key relationships with your spouse, with your children, with God, right? Or, thirdly, you could list your deepest fears. In pride, we fear failure, not being good enough, not knowing what to do, fear of not being perfect, right? In vanity, we fear rejection, disappointment, not being accepted, letting people down. In sensuality, we fear not being comfortable, bankruptcy, losing a job, getting sick, having to suffer. So that can also give us a lot of insight into what might be really driving us. Lastly, um, we could ask ourselves, what would make me perfectly happy and why? Right? I will be happy when I get married. Why? Well, finally somebody will love me. Mm -hmm. What's driving us there? I will be happy when I am CEO. Why? Well, I will have control. Or maybe I will have money. Or maybe because I will finally be respected. Right? Ask yourself why. I will be happy just when I get everything done in a day. Why? Well, I will have no pending worries. Nothing to worry about. So we can go deep down and ask ourselves these questions. And try to discover what is our dominant defect. But the key thing is that... Well, first of all, you're going to recognize that you have manifestations of all three dominant defects. And that's okay. It's good to recognize that. We all have manifestations of all three. Right? But the key is to find and choose the one dominant defect which is driving everything else. Right? Once we can discover that one defect, then we can take the axe to the trunk of the tree... And when we start knocking it away at that one defect, that one trunk, we can knock down the entire tree and all the bad fruits will go with it. Right? So this is the key. Discover the one dominant defect that is driving everything else. Right? Once we've chosen our one dominant defect, then we just want to list the key manifestations of it in our life. Okay? Just five or six. We don't want to be too much here. And, Here's a couple of examples of manifestations, right? Pride, putting my security in myself. I could be controlling, rationalizing, judging, always proving myself, independent, having self-pity parties, right? Vanity. I could be, of course, putting my security in what others think, seeking affirmation, attention, recognition, affection in a disordered way. Sensuality. Security in my possessions and pleasures. I could be sentimental, materialistic. I could be seeking a life of pleasure through comforts, escapes, intemperance, procrastination, or impurity. So choose your dominant defect and then write down a couple of manifestations, five or six, the way it manifests itself most in your life, and then we'll be ready to move on to the next part. 
looking at the fruits and going down to the trunk of the tree and discovering what our dominant defect is gives us a great deal of self-knowledge but there's still the roots that lie below the trunk that cause the different trunks in our lives so uh, we want to discover what that is now we don't have time to go into a deep analysis of this right now so I would suggest if you want to study this further that you read a book called Be Healed by Bob Schutz. But in our brief summary, what does the root system consist of? Well, there's fundamentally three things. First of all, we could have a lack of love in our life, right? And this happens to all of us in some way or another because nobody is perfect, right? This goes all the way back to our, the very beginning of our life our first experiences in our relationships with our parents, with our family, or other significant people. And there can be a lack of love simply, or there could be an abusive situation where there's a, a violation of boundaries in some way. Right? Now, that lack of love, that experience that we have, leads us then to a lie. And we believe, because of that experience, we believe a lie about ourselves. And this is fundamentally the lie of the devil, okay? And which is fundamentally, you are not loved and you are not lovable. Right? So lots of different ways that that can be expressed or experienced in our emotions and in our thoughts, but fundamentally it's that. You are not loved and you are not lovable. And the result of this is our own insecurity, okay? Now this is when... Um, the self-protection mechanisms kick in and we start to build up walls we try to protect ourselves so we make a vow right and this is the decision in the depths of our heart down in the root system that then starts to feed the trunk of the tree right if i'm not loved then i will obtain love by controlling and this is pride seeking security in oneself if i'm not loved I will obtain love by making everyone else love me. And this is vanity, seeking security in what others think of me. Or if I'm not loved, then there's no real love in relationships. I will buy love. This is sensuality, seeking love and happiness and fulfillment in possessions and the pleasures of the world. So this is fundamentally the dynamic of the root system. A bad life experience, a lack of love, which leads us to believe a lie about ourselves and then we make a vow to compensate for our insecurity. This vow ends up being what really drives our whole life, all our life decisions. The insecurity in the roots cause a false security in the trunk of pride, vanity, or sensuality, which in turn causes the bad fruits in our life, our actual sins. Now, we are only capable of loving to the degree in which we have been loved. Okay, so if in our life experiences we are loved a little, you know, that there's a great lack of love in our life, or maybe there's an abusive situation, then we're going to close up more inside and we're going to be less capable of loving others. Right? If we are loved a lot and in a proper way, then we'll be more capable of loving others. Okay, but no, whether we are loved a little or a lot, if we can open up to the love of God, then we will eventually have an infinite source of love in our lives. Right? St. John says in his first letter, chapter 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And really this again is the core of the whole spiritual life. Going back to that first experience of being the child of God, knowing that you are loved by God for who you are, right? that he loved you into existence, that he sustains you through his love, and he is leading you to fulfillment in his life, in his love for all eternity. Right? This is the foundation, the core of our whole spiritual life. And if we can experience this more and more deep down in the roots of our existence, then that is what begins to heal the whole tree. Right? So what we need to do is convert the driver, right? If before it was the vow, my insecurity, 
that was driving all my life decisions. I was trying to control love or to be loved in some way. Well, now, if I can convert that in the root system from a lack of love to the experience of God's infinite and conditional love for me, well, then I I'm healed. And it becomes the love of Christ that impels me, right? And this becomes the new driver of my life. I live then uh, according to my baptism, which is to reject the lie of the devil and to embrace Christ in my life. The love of Christ impels us, as St. Paul says. And that then drives our life to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit, of faithfulness, of modesty, self-control, gentleness, kindness, goodness, generosity, chastity, patience, charity, joy, and peace. Right? And this is what Christ means when he says, I want your life to bear fruit, and bear fruit that remains. Right? One time during a retreat, a woman came in for spiritual direction, and she had been working on her program of life for 15 years, and um, she came in, the first thing she said was, Father, I think I'm going to change my dominant defect once again. Right? I thought it was pride, but I think now I think it's actually vanity, and... I said, okay, wait a second. Why don't we start with the vocation statement? All right. So we worked through that. We wrote it out. And I said, now, what is keeping you from living that? And she said, the fear of being used. I said, wow, that is really deep, right? That says a lot. And so we began to analyze the roots from the perspective of that one statement, the fear of being used. Right? And so we discovered that there truly were very tough life experiences where she had been used in relationships, right? And this led her to the lie to believe that um, uh, she was not loved for who she is, but for another purpose, which was the selfish desires of the other, right? And this in turn led to the vow, um, if, you know, I am loved for another purpose, right? If love is always manipulative, then I will never make myself truly vulnerable again. And so she closed herself off internally. And this then, for her, fed into a root uh, dominant defect of sensuality. And she sought her happiness in superficial relationships, in materialism, and ultimately promiscuity. Okay. So... As we look back over these tough experiences, through prayer she discovered the light of Christ shining on those very experiences. And she realized that Christ was with her and suffered with her. And her suffering was a suffering with Christ on the cross. And simply by the presence of Christ there in those difficult moments, uh, she was healed, right? Shines the light of Christ and the truth of Christ on her. And she heard Christ telling her that... I love you for who you are, and I will never use you for another end. Right? She was a little confused, wondering why her sinfulness still bothered her if she had already brought all these things to confession. But then again, she heard Christ telling her, I am not forgiving your sins, but I am healing the disfigured image that you have of yourself. Wow, that is really profound, really beautiful. right? And that's precisely what happened. Her whole root system was healed, right? If she had that lack of love that led to the lie about herself and the vow, all of that was healed through the experience of Christ, the experience of God's infinite love for her. And now it became, you know, that love of Christ, which was impelling her to be able to open her heart up again. And now she was capable of loving her spouse, her children, and even the very people that hurt her so much in her life, right? And this made her... Truly, it was a true conversion <clears throat> and helped her to really um, become an authentic apostle, right? It, it bore so many beautiful fruits in her life because now she, she wants to just give herself to people. She wants everybody to have that very experience of the love of Christ in their lives. Knowing the trunk and the root system gives us great clarity in our lives and understanding what our obstacle is. Uh, what are those rocks and thorns that we need to pull out? in order to make our lives bear fruit, right? And God's love is what heals us on the deepest level. But at the same time, we have to recognize that it's not magic. It doesn't all happen just at once like that. 
it is a lifelong process, right? We have bad habits, our vices, right, which are deeply ingrained in our behaviors. And so we need uh, to replace them with good habits, which are called virtues. And this leads us to the next part, the program. Part three, the program. Choosing the opposite virtue and the means to form it. So here we want to go back to our principle that our program of life needs to be positive. So we always want to keep our ideal, Jesus Christ, and our vocation statement in front of us. But here specifically we want to choose a virtue, right? And working on a virtue is a positive work in the spiritual life that helps us to overcome those defects in order to fulfill our vocation. Okay. So what is a virtue? Virtue is a good habit that is formed through the repetition of single acts that become second nature to the person. And this makes uh, doing the good easier and more consistent. Why do we need a virtue? We need a virtue to be free from vice in order to love, right? This is the key. We don't form virtue just for the sake of virtue. Well, I'm the most virtuous person in the world. Well, actually, that makes you the most proud person in the world, right? Uh, we form virtue in order to be free of those sinful habits, right? We, we, we change those sinful habits with good habits, which are virtues, so that we are free from all our enslavement to sin, and then we are capable of loving, of fulfilling our vocation, of giving ourselves to others, right? So the great question is, what do I need in order to live my vocation statement, right? This is the question. What do I need in order to live my vocation statement? For example, I am a beloved son of the Father, and I am called to be a loving spouse and father. But what keeps me from that is my anger. Therefore, I need to work on humility so that I don't get upset when things don't go my way, and I can be the loving husband and father God is calling me to be. Or maybe I need to work on patience or compassion or meekness. Whatever is going to best help you overcome your obstacle in order to live your vocation. You probably know instinctively what it is. So write that down first. Right? The one word answer. It's going to help you before you dive in to a list of virtues. Choosing the opposite virtue. Here's a list of virtues that correspond to those dominant defects. And pride, we have humility, obedience, simplicity, supernatural spirit, meekness, compassion, docility, charity, service to others, dependence on God. Vanity, we have purity of intention, love for Christ, seeing Christ in others, true acceptance of oneself, and purity. Sensuality, we see discipline for love of Christ, focus on the person of Christ, abnegation and self-denial for love of Christ, hope, Spirit of loving sacrifice, patience, and purity. The key here, just like with the dominant defect, you just have to choose one virtue. We only want to work on one virtue at a time so we have clear direction in our spiritual life, right? And it stays positive. Once we've chosen the virtue, we want to choose concrete, concrete ways to forge the virtue in my life, okay? So, um, first of all here, a couple of things. We want to avoid a checklist mentality. Okay. So, if I'm going to work on humility, right, maybe some good concrete ways to work on that would be by going to Mass every day, praying my rosary, making sacrifices, and not getting mad when people treat me poorly, right? Now, uh, those are all great things, but if we reduce it to a kind of a checklist and say, well, I went to Mass today to pray my rosary, you know, I did my meditation, and I didn't get mad at anybody, you know, you check off this list, you know. Uh, we could actually do all those things without necessarily growing in humility. In fact, on the contrary, we could possibly even be growing in pride because we just fulfilled our little checklist perfectly once again. So we're, we're perfect, right? Um, or, you know, what happens in your day if you don't have the opportunity to go to Mass, you don't have time to do your meditation or pray your rosary? Or what if nobody's actually mean to you in a day? Does that mean that you don't have the opportunity to live your virtue in that day? 
No, obviously not. So what we want to do here is begin uh, to make our virtue concrete in our lives by looking at the virtue in light of our relationships. Okay. Now remember, God is love. God is in relationship. We are made in the image and likeness of God. So we are called to love in those specific relationships in our life. Okay. As we saw before, we have those key relationships. God, our spouse, children, others, ourselves, whatever, according to your state in life. Okay. So what we want to do before we actually start to make a list of really concrete actions is we want to make a specific application of our virtue to each of those relationships. Right? Because it's going to be in those relationships where we live virtue or vice. Right? Because that's where we love or we lack love. Okay? So we could call this like an attitude for each one of those relationships. And I'll give you an example, maybe for somebody who is working on the virtue of humility, maybe somebody specifically struggling with being controlling. In the relationship with God, I will discover the truth of who I am before Him, that everything I have and am is a free gift from Him. I will trust in God. With my spouse, I will discover the dignity that my spouse has, that he or she is a gift from God and my equal and deserving of all my respect. With my children, I will discover that they are not my own, but a gift from God to be led back to Him. With others, I will see them as God sees them, as a gift, desiring their good. Okay. With myself, I will accept myself and my limitations as I am. Okay, so those are the general attitudes. And once you have those down and clear, well, then you will always have the opportunity to be exercising your virtue in every moment of your day, because that encompasses everything right there. It doesn't depend on whether you made it to Mass or prayed your rosary or not. You know, please God, you will be able to do that. But here you have the opportunity then always to be forming those virtues in a specific way with each of those relationships. But to leave your program of life just with a list of attitudes on, on a general level would be a little bit vague. Okay, So we do want to make it more concrete. So once you have those attitudes written out, then what you want to do is put one or two or maybe three really concrete ways to live out your virtue below each of those categories. So for example, with God, I'll do a meditation every day contemplating how Christ related to God, his Father, and trusted in him. I'll pray my rosary every day contemplating Mary's humility and trust in God's plan for her life. I will make an act of surrender to God every morning during my morning offering and trust that he will lead every step of my day. With my spouse, every day I will take 10 minutes before arriving home from work to contemplate my spouse, to see him or her from God's perspective, to recognize him or her as a gift in order to open my heart towards him or her. I will discover what he or she is feeling, thinking, desiring today, and do one thing that will be supportive. I will respect his or her dignity and make decisions in communion with him or her. Okay, so once we have those concrete means, we're ready to go back, as we said in the beginning, to the ideal and the motto, right? This is like writing the introduction to a book. You want to wait till everything's done and then go back and write the beginning. Okay, so the ideal, Jesus Christ. It will always be Jesus Christ and specifically how he lived the one virtue we are focusing on, okay? So here, for example, if I'm working on humility, my ideal will be Jesus Christ, meek and humble of heart. Or if I'm working on trust, Jesus Christ, beloved Son of the Father. Or if diligence, Jesus Christ, man of the mission. With that done, I can make my motto. And the motto is supposed to be simply a battle cry to refocus us on the very essence of our entire program, something that really moves us, right? So for example here, maybe we could say, I have come to serve, or Jesus, I trust in you, or I can do all things in him who has strengthened me, or set your hearts on things above. So that's it. You've got all your program ready. Now it's time to put all the pieces together. 
and this is the format ideal motto vocation statement then you write down your obstacle your one dominant defect with its principal manifestations in your life just put down five or six there then you make your program and choose your corresponding virtue your one virtue and you lift, list the means to form that virtue right there's different ways you can do that i would uh, personally suggest doing it in those categories of god spouse children others and self but you could list it in other ways if you want um, the key there is not to confuse it with the vocation statement itself that is the the broader ideal that god has for you in your life here is specifically how i'm going to form that virtue that i need in these different relationships finally how to use your program first of all make it simple try to fit it on one page and then keep it in a handy place maybe in the front of your prayer book where you can find it easily right don't put it down in the bottom of your drawer where you're never going to find it again okay secondly you want to try to review it at various times in your day first in your morning offering uh, try to look over it the basic points and see how you could be living that in your day right depending on the activities that you expect to be living secondly in your prayer time when you go to prayer try to focus on your virtue right oftentimes it's easy to go from one devotion to another from one spiritual book to another from one homily to another and get all these different inspirations of the holy spirit and they're all great ideas but again it can become a little bit uh you know dispersive in our, in our lives right so in order to create unity and direction and drive in our spiritual life in order to make progress i want to try to focus all of that in our one virtue okay and you'll discover how the holy spirit is speaking through all those different things those different devotions prayer books uh you know books homilies everything the holy spirit is actually communicating that one message to you that you need that you most need right so this is not limiting in your spiritual life, but it is like harnessing all the energy and driving it in one direction. Right? Third, uh, your conscience exams, right? This is a time to go back and look over the ways in which maybe you didn't correspond to God's love in your life, okay, in your day. And here it's very helpful to use your program of life, okay? To look at your life through the perspective of your dominant defect and the manifestations that it could have in your day right and so you can begin to get to know yourself more and more as you see how that dominant defect is actually manifesting itself in in your day okay fourth in confession right of course confession is another opportunity for an examination of conscience but also uh, imagine if you go to a confession and you say you know my dominant defect is pride or whatever it is and then you talk about the ways in which it manifests itself in in your in your week your month however long it's been since your last confession okay that makes it much more concrete and uh helps you out it helps the the confessor as well to understand where you're coming from but on top of that you are confessing maybe not just a couple little sins that may have occurred in in since the previous confession but you are confessing the very you know root of your sinfulness right so it can be a more profound confession for yourself and on top of that you're receiving god's mercy on the very root of your sinfulness okay and so as we talked about before when we experience god's love and the depth of our wounds and our in our in our you know root system there that is the most healing part so if in every confession we can experience that as god's mercy on our root system you know that's going to heal us from the inside out in a deeper and more profound way lastly you want to use it in spiritual direction okay and this is uh, going to help you hold you accountable for your work in your spiritual life and it also is going to give you more light you're going to understand better how to use it how to better work on your virtue and what direction you need to be taking according to the current circumstances of your life okay so your program of life provides really a framework for your entire spiritual work right it's a real gift to have that clarity of where you need to be going and it gives you drive and direction and you'll be making a lot more progress in your spiritual life so we've seen how um, god shows us the ideal the rich soil which is jesus christ 
God's plan for us, right? Our vocation statement. Who is God calling me to be? We've seen the obstacle, right? Those rocks and thorns that keep us from living our vocation statement, right? And lastly, we see the program. What is the virtue that I need in order to overcome those obstacles, in order to live my life to the full, so that my life bears fruit as Jesus Christ wants? So that's it. Good luck, and I'll be praying for you. God bless.